Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. <laughs> Today, um, we uh, we have a few people missing, okay, but uh, they are they are coming. They are on the way, and uh, we're going to talk about camera settings for beginners. So, let's say you just bought a new camera and you are thinking about what settings would be best for you and uh, how to make the most of your camera and also learn things quickly. We're going to show you some hacks that will make your life easy and cause you to make less mistakes. And um, mm -hmm. and yeah, my name is Salom. Uh, business name is Meek Photos. Um, I'm on Instagram as Meek Photos Vision. Uh, so uh, connect with me and let's have a chat. And I'm excited to be here today. All right, Paul. Awesome. To yeah, thanks. Uh, it's a good topic, I think, because even people that have been at photography a long time, I think we all need like a little refresher at some point because we kind of forget the basics a little bit. So it's always good to kind of have like a refresher if you've been at photography for a long time or if you're new and you're just trying to figure out like what everything means because you know it gets a little bit confusing. So it should be a good chat. Uh, Evans is in like the green room and he's just, oh, there, well, there's Brian. So Brian just came on, which is great. Um, and then we're just waiting for Evans. So uh, yeah, guys. So if you, again, if you're on the, if you're watching, please uh, like this video. It's on Meek's channel. Subscribe to him. He's trying to reach a thousand. So uh, make sure you, you do that if you haven't. And uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Paul, and uh, I also have a YouTube channel. If you guys don't know, please check it out. Subscribe if you dig it. And I run a photography meetup group called Get Out Shoot Toronto. So if you're in the Toronto area, visit us at getoutshoot.com, and we do all kinds of meetups and Zoom sessions and all kinds of fun stuff. So check us out and uh, yeah, it's gonna be a blast. Can't wait to steal all your secrets, Meeks. <laughs> Cause I don't know what I'm doing to be honest with you. I just pick up the camera and go. All right, bad boy. Brian, that's your Brian James on the, on the internet. Called a bad boy. That means You're the bad boy of the. Of the I like. Squad. I like. I like your. I like your backlight today. Yeah, I know he's not. He's not playing it's, today, man. It's like it is. It is on point. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like the, the the contrast of the the backlight and the warmth of the light on your face. You know. Nice. nice man. Do you know what's on the op You know what's on the opposite side of a color wheel. You know what's opposite of blue. Uh. Orange. I remember. Like my face. Like teal and orange. That's why I did color wheel is another good topic to go over too. That's why I did this. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Brian James. Sorry, I'm late. Um, okay. Yeah. Will dock your pay. Fifth. Just check that. Minutes. Appreciate it. What are we talking about? Are we talking about camera. <laughs> we're talking about we're talking about how to get off auto. <laughs> get off auto. Get off auto, man. Get off auto for sure. You know what? Let me let me put put up the um the the thumbnail here it might help some of y'all all right <laughs> <laughs> all right so this is what we are talking about today share screen that one share all right guys this is what we're talking about today man it's so basically what settings do you think will help a beginner at least make uh, less mistakes and mm -hmm. aid them learn as well you know we can talk about things like why would you use a uh, back button focus uh, why would you would you use any of the other settings apart from manual like aperture uh priority if you're priority? just if you're brand new to photography i would i personally would start with the aperture mode why is that well, because you can play around with like depth of field, right? You can play around with composition. You can understand what the f stops does. Um, when I when I do the beginner workshops for get out shoot, I usually I usually start the workshops on aperture mode, just because I want to show people like what depth of field does and why it's important in your composition and how you can frame subject. You don't agree? I agree. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm also more of a composition too, right? Like the settings is important. Yes, for sure. But you also need to understand like what you're, what you're shooting, like why you're shooting and how you're framing it. So like the composition, the settings go hand in hand. And I just find that people that are brand new to photography, they, they don't know what f-stop is. 
to explain what depth of field is to people, I think people have people tend to understand that a little bit more. When you when you like, I'll take example like fruit because I have an example like I took a picture of like an orange in my kitchen and I used like the different f stops and they and they saw how the background changes. So they kind of understood why aperture is important and why you want to shoot at f one point eight in certain situations versus like f thirteen and vice versa. Good points, good point, good point. We have a, a few comments here. Um, ben, is, ben is the best. <laughs> I like the <laughs> second point. I like uh, the second point. It's yes, good. I like the second. The first point, I don't fully agree with it, even though I do it. Um, the uh, the focus confirmation, uh, if you are a noob, you probably need that, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> it's very likely you might not have set up your, if you have an optical viewfinder, and then you have to set the is it is it called diopter or biopter? The that little thing on the side. Is it diopter? Yeah, Evans, I can't hear Evans, you. Evans, we can't hear you. You're on mute. <laughs> Mr. Audio. We're <laughs> <laughs> gonna get in trouble for that. Evans live video on how to clean up audio. You know, for one day we're gonna make a live and say how to fix Evans audio <laughs> for good. <laughs> yeah. So um oh, so yes if you don't if you don't know diopter diopter mix okay ben. Yeah. okay diopter if you don't know how to set that when you don't set it right when you look through your optical viewfinder your image might look like it's sharp but it's probably not because you haven't set it with the sensor but if you have a mirrorless that's not an issue because what you see is what you get yeah. uh so as a beginner you might actually need that focus confirmation it's okay to sound like a noob and get a, a sharp a sharp image <laughs> so <laughs> yeah but the second point the second point is a great one right there that's the first thing you need to disable it i don't even know why they enable why? that maybe just for testing purposes or something maybe. i think on my first nikon i could take like two or three pictures uh, right. without a card in it and sometimes I would I would set it up and test it one two pictures and then take it out for the gig and uh, no you know so yeah me too yeah all right Ben I find the opera more critical with EVF optical has been more forgiven Ben you should really come on the show tonight I think you can really uh, help us out here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey 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 to uh, Maryland drone guy Maryland drone guy is here how's the drone going how's the drone flying going all right, so Evans, you so, back? Can we hear Evans, you? Uh, Paul, uh, no, no, uh, Brian, what tricks do you have up your sleeves for beginners? Up my sleeve for beginners. Okay, well, you know, I, it's not so much a trick. I just wanted to ask: Does anyone use those other? Um, I should I should have grabbed my camera. I saw in the photo that you put up there. I had like the landscape, the yeah. portrait button. It has. Hello. I never use those. The close up. I was just curious if, if any of you guys have ever used those before. Maybe at the very beginning, but I don't really use them now. At the very beginning. I don't think I they're started. a good way to teach though. If you want to teach settings, if you want to teach actual like how to figure out settings. I was just thinking that I've I've never used it's funny because like when, when I take a picture on my cell phone sometimes those symbols will pop up like the flower yeah. or the portrait or whatever. Yeah. I just think it's odd. Um settings for uh, for beginners. Okay, here's one that I can think of off the top of my head. So um I shoot in uh, manual or aperture priority. Sometimes I even shoot auto if I'm feeling lazy, but um, mostly I've been shoot shooting only manual lately. But what I will say is if like Paul mentioned aperture priority, which I love, especially if it's night or I'm doing portraits and I know mm -hmm. I want to do that at a certain, you know, um, F stop to get the depth of field. Yeah. Or, or if I needed a, if I need that, that 1.8 or 1.4 at nighttime, so I don't have to bump my ISO so high. I will say this, depending on the camera you have, and if you know your the range, um, you know, of what your, your camera looks good at. Um, when I shoot aperture priority, I like to go into, um, on the Sony menu, I can go to auto ISO, mm -hmm. and then auto ISO, I can set a range. And so right. if I'm shooting um, after sunset uh, until dark, I'll change my auto ISO from 400 to 6400 mm -hmm. um, on my, a7 III on my A6000, I'll go 400 to 3200 because I feel like after 3200, it doesn't look as well. Yeah. Um, but I like to uh, I like to set that 
auto ISO. So I'll, I'll, I'll stay in auto or aperture priority, but I'll let the camera decide my ISO up until a certain point. Yeah. And the reason I like that is if I if I keep it on straight auto or or I mean, if you're selecting your ISO at that point, you might as well just be a manual. But if I'm in aperture priority and I just put it on straight auto, sometimes on my Sony camera, um, you know, I'll start shooting at 12,800, um, over 20,000 ISO if it's really dark. And even though it's a great camera, there's no there's noticeable grain, and that's not always bad. But I like to I like to minimize that. So, yeah. I'll, um, you know, I rather have the shutter speed a little bit slower, shoot wide open at 1.8 or 1.4, and then and then uh, do that. So, that's that's probably my 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 big tip um, is uh, if you're shooting aperture priority, go in and set your parameters for your camera. And if you're shooting during the daytime, and your native ISO is 100 or 200, then set that as your minimum and then you, then only maybe raise it to 800 or 1,000, something like that. Yeah, you definitely want to make sure your ISO is in the right range because nothing worse than an overexposed photo when you thought you got a banger because your ISO was at, you know, 10 million. I was actually like just about to start, it was, it was a couple months ago, I was just about to start a shoot and I was, before the the client got there, I, there were some cool pictures of the CN Tower, I know, I'm sorry, but I was like, taking pictures of it. And it yeah. looked good, but I was like blown out. But I was like, oh, whatever. I got my settings dialed in. And then right before the model came, I looked at my uh, at my screen, and I was at ISO 12,800. Yeah. So see what I mean? It happens to everyone. Yeah. You just got to make sure on that stuff, right? Especially when it wasn't it wasn't super blown out. So in, my, so in my electronic viewfinder, I thought it looked fine. But I was like, something was off. So I was like, what's going on with this? And I was like, oh, man, thank God I didn't do the whole shoot like that. Yeah. And so, that's the benefit of, of, of just practicing with your camera because once you look at it you kind of know oh something's wrong with this photo mm -hmm. and then you're mm -hmm. able to figure it out and that comes with practice have you have you guys ever done a shoot and then at the end of the shoot you realize that you you end up with blurry images because mm -hmm. your shutter speed was too low for yeah. your your lens <laughs> yep yeah that's that's one thing that uh beginners always struggle with and, and my tip for that, it's always make sure that uh, at a minimum, st when you start off, set your shutter speed as twice the focal length of your of your lens. Yeah. Right. right. So. Yeah, that's good. That's a good tip. Yeah. Twice is, 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 is a safe range. But yeah. uh, the, the rule in the books are saying it should be either the same. Like if you're shooting with a yeah. 50, you shouldn't shoot uh, slower than 1 over 50. Right, but, yeah. but yeah, but they're exactly one 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 hundredth of a second on your shutter speed. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the reason yeah. why I say twice is so normally you, if you're shooting at fifty millimeter, you could shoot at fifty, right? Yeah. But then also don't forget that it's not just you; it's also your subject. So if your subject moves a little bit, you you could shoot at fifty and hold it as still as possible. But if your subject shifts or moves a little bit, that would also introduce some element of motion mm -hmm. into the shot. Mm -hmm. So if you want to freeze it, um, twice the shutter speed is it's a safe zone to start from. So if I'm shooting like a 50 millimeter, I will maybe start off at 100 or 125 per second, uh, mm -hmm. just to give myself some extra latitude to, of play for that kind of movement and stuff. But if you're in really low light and you have to go down, well, you can play with it, but you got to make sure that both yourself and your, your subject are as still as possible. Yeah. A good tip and one um uh one thing you guys said earlier which is very important is make sure you set the range uh i, I don't know about you guys but on the nikon i, I cannot send a, a range i can only set the maximum iso so yeah. if i set if i put something on aperture priority i can say maximum iso is four thousand so no matter what the camera is not going to go past four thousand but it's free to go below that now if you are shooting on shutter priority, it's crazy. The ISO just goes. And if you really miss that on the ISO, just like they said, you'll be shooting at ISO 100,000 or something like that. I had a second shooter one time at a wedding, and there were, the dance was going on, and he was shooting uh, with uh, shutter priority because he said, oh, you know what? The dance, the shutter speed must be fast, but then he's not quick to change the other settings. So... He, he had his shutter speed fast, and that would not change. Mm -hmm. and I think it was another one, one over 250, and the camera was doing everything else for him. 
Now, of course, his ISO was <laughs> very, very high. <laughs> I think it was yeah. like 12,000 something. And yeah. uh, the, it pictures looked okay on the back of the camera. But when you put it in the computer, that's when you realize that it's not, no, it's not good. So, yeah. Yeah. So and, and that would that. bring me to a tip I wanted to share. Um, it ties into what you just said. One thing I have learned is that not to rely on the back of your screen as much as possible. Hmm. Right? Um, sometimes we rely too much on what we're seeing at the back of the screen, but once you have that um, enlarged, you're going to see that there's a lot of in, uh, imperfections, right? So when you're checking um, the back of your screen, always make sure you use that zoom button, right? Zoom in so you can have a closer look at some of the critical areas of, of the image. Um, I always try to zoom in around the eyes, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. That's to check critical focus because when you're looking at a full picture on the back of your screen, you're really not seeing where all those um, hidden stuff are. 100%. This happens to me a lot, Ishman. Oh yeah, that's what Ishman said. Okay, so I have a question for you guys. Let's vote on this. Uh, back button focus or, or the focus on the Shutter on the release, shutter release button. <laughs> I do back button every time. Every camera I've got since I found out about back button, button I have switched everything to back button. Um, the good thing is that on the Sony cameras where you shoot back button, you don't really lose much because you have the ability to remove focus from the shutter. Um, on other cameras, back button becomes a problem because you're, you're, if you can remove the uh, focus from the shutter, then even though you back button focus, when you tap that shutter button, it's still gonna try to focus again, right? Well, then, then you don't. You, you, then you don't have back button focus in that sense. <laughs> no, they have, but there's uh, some cameras have two settings where you have to actually physically, like in the menu, remove the um, the ability for the shutter like to focus. Disable the right? shutter. Disable the sh mm -hmm. shutter from focus. But if you, you just enable back button shutter without disabling that, mm -hmm. then you're going to have some issues. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. okay. And what's the advantage of back button focus? Like why okay, would someone, I'm gonna give why you, would someone I'm, use it? Okay, Paul, I'm going to give you an example of when I like to use back button focus. So, for example, if I'm shooting, uh, let's say I'm shooting a dancer and then uh, he or she's probably going to spin around or move around a lot. Now, Here's what happens. I might be far away. Maybe I want to shoot at the shallow depth of field, right? Mm -hmm. And with that, I don't have a lot of room to play with. But I can ask them to stand still. I would focus on their face. And so when you set up a proper back button focus, that means that you disable focus on the shutter release mm -hmm. button. Mm -hmm. So once I focus on their face and I tell them to spin, but I ask them to stay on the same axis so they shouldn't move forward or backwards, but they can move side and side. And while they are spinning, I just put my, my camera on uh, on burst, and then yeah. I press and hold the shutter release button, and then da -da 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 -da. and yeah. it's the camera is not going to attempt to focus during that sequence. So once she yeah. remains in the plane, it will keep going, it will keep shooting, and hopefully most of them will be in focus. Yeah. Now, if you didn't have that, every time you try to press it, the camera will try to focus before focus. and you you probably miss a lot of them or grab stuff that's out of focus so that's yeah. my example. back button focus is really good especially uh if you're shooting spots or fast action movements and that stuff uh, even for portraits it's help you to really focus faster because your your shutter is not doing the focus once you press it right because you when in a normal focusing environment you're going to have to half press that shutter Mm -hmm. Wait for it to acquire focus before you press it down to to take the image. Mm -hmm. Whereas in back button focus, you can pre-focus by just holding down that back back button key with your thumb, and then whenever you're ready, the shutter all the shutter is doing is just doing the the shot, click click click, and you're done. Seamless. But even even with the like the advancement of like the eye auto focus and things like that, you still feel. I mean, I guess I guess it is more efficient. It doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to get the. See, with back button focus, though, I think like you don't. It's more efficient, but it doesn't guarantee that you got the sh the shot sharp mm -hmm. or in focus. Right. Yeah. That like that's why like for portraits, I like that it has the eye autofocus, the Stonies, 
So, it's... so um, on the Sony's, um, back backing focus works with the eye autofocus as well. Oh, so does it really? you, Yeah, so once you hit that back button, as long as the eye is in the frame, Sony is locking onto the eye. Mm. That's, That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Back, hey, uh, Evans, okay. Evans, it's the same with the, the Nikon Z system, okay? <laughs> I, I'm, not I'm a, just saying because I've yeah. never used a Nikon. I'm, Z, I'm the Z6 boy. and the Z5? Yep, Z6, Z5, Z7, the eye cool. of the focus. I, I mean, yeah. people say Sony is better, but at the end of the day, hey, it's the two. But, but well, like... I mean, I think I think Nikon and Canon are are catching up fast. So, you know, whatever it is, what it is. But yeah, uh, hey, really Nikon, cool. if you want me to test out one of your new Z cameras, go ahead and send it to me. I'll send give it, it a shot. Send it, send it. See send if you can put me. Convert. <laughs> yeah, back button focus. The king of back button focus is here. Kobe, Kobe's in the uh, chat. <laughs> yeah, but uh, Brian, I really Kobe. feel like if they give you a Z7 to test it out, you will be sold. Because yeah. your kind of images and the, the quality you're going to get, you, you'll be sold right as <laughs> far. Bring it on. Bring it on, Nikon. Give it to me for free. I'm in. Yeah, I, I think one of these days I'm going to try a Nikon. I've never shot a Nikon. When I started, I shot You should make a YouTube video, man. You should make a yeah, video. Yeah, and then I moved, video. My first, my I first moved to Sony. Nikon. Nikon. I, I, would, I would love to one day try out a Nikon and see how it, it works out. <laughs> I'm waiting for the YouTube bit. Ben's dropping some serious knowledge. With Fuji, you can set up for focus mode. I have shutter autofocus on continuous, but back button on the rest. Nice. Nikon. Oh, I got it. <laughs> Kobe. So, um... <laughs> oh, wait, wait a second. Let me see. Let me pull this stuff up. <laughs> Kobe's just trolling now. So, so you want to come on, man? Uh, <laughs> All right, what else yeah, for beginners? I I know he really doesn't like this. Okay, so guys, uh, there is, I don't know if any of you have ever, ha, has any of you ever used the depth of field calculator? Never. No. I have. What is okay. that? I used a scientific calculator when I was in college. Oh, no, wow. it, it, there's, there's, there's an app on uh, the Android yeah. store or the iOS store called depth of field calculator. Yeah. Um, mostly for me, it seems more of a, a landscape thing. Um, mm -hmm. for people who want to get infinity focus and stuff like that, um, it just tells you what distance to focus at to get almost everything in, mm -hmm. in focus. Right. So. Right. But, uh, I mean, I mean, I have found a lot of use for it. Right. Other than, um, um, maybe, I, maybe I should pull something up here. Let me pull something up here and let me talk about this first and I'll pull so there are so many web apps as oh, well, and it looks scary, man. <laughs> <laughs> this looks like, okay. this looks like a so, driving. So here, here's the thing: it's not complicated. You have to just pick out pick out your three favorite lenses that you use to shoot. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt anybody will have way more than three that they shoot very often, right? So if you have three that you shoot often, just grab those lenses and then learn about them so for example i like to shoot with my 135 and my 35 a lot and so if um if i'm shooting with the 135 i know that even if i'm at f4 and the person is about five uh, feet away from me mm -hmm. i only have this much in focus right and those figures those numbers are like ingrained in my mind so there will not be any time that somebody will ask me to take a picture real quick and there's a bunch of people and I'll ever be at F4 with that distance using my 135. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but it's just a, a natural thing. When I pick it up, I just know that, hey, uh, so let's let's check, for example, let's check the- Yeah, run, run, run one. Five. What? Focal length, why, why is the camera important here? Maybe I should have picked I should have researched this before bringing it online. <laughs> yeah, okay, you, you have a 7D there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no, no, I can take it out of position. Okay, let's say uh, 10 is good enough, right? Let's calculate this and see. All right, I probably should have re researched a different one before bringing it on. But there's a different uh, web one that I use. 
and uh, okay botched next topic let's keep it moving <laughs> <laughs> they don't even have the z6 on here <laughs> oh man <laughs> oh, yeah, this, this one looks a little outdated. Yeah, Nikon T6 right? is not on that list. It's awful. Yeah. It's, this it's, one looks a little outdated, but oh, there's an on. app. There's I'll, an I'll, app I'll for find it. the one that I use. There has to be an app for it. There's an app for it, and 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 it's good, especially if you are out, you shoot outdoors a lot, right? Um, and you want to get the best. It just tells you basically um, your lens, your sensor type, um, at what focal length, distance you you are focusing from the subject and what you're going to get based on the depth of field then so he's going to just calculate that there's some math there to it mm. but you can let the app do all that for you and still have fun there's an app for that that takes the fun out of shooting wow i gotta do math before i shoot <laughs> <laughs> well the the landscape photographers do all the time right because they want to get they yeah. really focus, so they always yeah. want to make sure that they go through this kind of stuff, so that wherever they are focusing, their their image is going to be sharp from the beginning all the way to the end. Everything will be in focus. Yeah. Hmm. Right, and if you are taking a, a twenty second exposure, you don't want to do too many of those before you you nail the shot. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when you're uh, waiting for the sun to go down and you got a six minute window. Exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Evans, you want to explain what in, infinity focus is to the people in the chat if they don't know what it oh, is? Oh, um, infinity focus, basically, it's every lens has um, some sort of focus range or distance from which if you focus, it doesn't matter what f-stop you're using, you're going to end up with um, basically everything in the frame sharp, right? Yeah. That's what we call infin infinity focus. It's just basically at, what, at, at, at let's say, at f4, uh, what distance do I have to put my focus point to get everything f in front and behind as sharp as they can be? Right. Yeah, makes sense. And would you would you advise anyone to use infinity focus to focus uh, to photograph uh, people? No, no. Okay. So for for portraits, it's not that critical. Uh, for landscapes. Well, unless you're doing environmental portraits, right? Where you really want to show the environment and you want everything to be in, in focus. Uh, but I personally want, um, I probably will end up just picking something that will give a little bit of uh, a deeper depth of field, but not infinity, you know, focus. Um, but if you're doing landscape, like I said, it's, it's very critical, right? Uh, for landscape work, but for portrait work, you don't really have to worry about that. So gotta make sure your model's in focus. But that being said, one thing that I want to share is that we need to stay away from that attitude of shooting everything at the widest aperture. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You don't like it? Right? Um, I've seen weddings where you're shooting someone's wedding, the person has spent a lot on the location, and then everything is shot at f1.2. So they really don't get the beauty of that location they've paid yeah. for. Right. You shot it in your uh, backyard. Do you want to know the difference? Right, because we all we all got into that point where we want to blow out everything and yeah, that bokeh. Yeah, um, that bokeh thing. But it's good. Uh, but I also feel like sometimes we use it as a clutch too much mm -hmm. instead of showing some of the environment for people to see mm -hmm. uh, the 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 beauty of the location. Right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point actually. You found another okay. one. Uh, oh, no, oh, it's, it's, oh, a, it's the same oh, one. It's the same one, but I just realized that the cal the calculation was actually showing on the right side, so I can still just talk about it real quick. So this is just an example, right? You are shooting with a 135 lens, and you're shooting at f1.8, like Evans is just talking about. If your subject is 10 feet away from you, you only have 0 0.1 feet, 0 0.11 feet in total in focus. So right. if you use the single point autofocus and you put it on the subject that's exactly 10 feet away from you, usually one third of the focus is in front and two thirds is in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they tell you that the near limit is 9.94 feet. So the, the focus starts from there 
and then it barely extends a little bit um, behind the, the subject. So if you know that you only have 0 0.1 uh, in focus, that is just a good mindset to have that you shouldn't be shooting. If there's two people there and they are close to you, you shouldn't just really want to blur out the background so much that you would go down to f1.8, mm -hmm. you know, because you know that this is your limit. So you tell them to either move further back. So if you realize that if we increase the the distance here, um, our depth of field is going to increase. And we still don't even have a, a whole foot in focus. We, we, we have about half. Yeah. We only have six inches in focus at 20 feet away. That's crazy. We only have yep. this much yeah. in focus. <laughs> so, and, if, and if you want everything in focus, you should see your half a focal distance right there. Yeah, exactly. Kind of <laughs> uh -huh. there, there you go <laughs> so um, i don't understand what the circle of confusion is i'm probably going to learn it after the show today um but but it's good to understand the circle of, the circle of confusion of the people in the chat right now i don't know what that is either oh, man, that, that is funny. <laughs> but before you talk about that i mean so change your f-stop to say four because Right. I find that's kind of like my sweet spot when I'm photographing more than two people, especially if it's a family or they, it's like a, a um, maybe like a, a mom and dad and the baby on, in front of them or on their lap or sitting in, you know what I mean? Right. Because right. I've made that mistake too as a beginner a couple years ago. Same thing. I'm like, oh, my lens shoots at 1.8. This will be great. The, the background's ugly. I'll blur it out. And then I realize the baby's in focus and the mom and dad isn't. Or the exactly. mom's in focus. Exactly. Or they stand shoulder to shoulder. And even at like F2.2, you got like her eyes and you got his first eye and then the rest of his body is blurred because you only have, you know, maybe yeah. six or eight inches in total focus. So, yeah. and if you have enough distance between your background anyways, you know, you 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 could still, especially with a long lens, like a 135 and an F4, you're still going to, the background's still going to be kind of creamy, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's so, what's so, so, okay. So if we, we change this to F4, right? Um, yeah. with F4 and as the subject is 10 feet away, which is quite reasonable. You, you, sometimes you get people 10 feet away, but yeah. I'm, I'm a little extreme with the 135 because I just want people to understand this is the lens I've used a lot. So I know how, um, you know, how it can throw you off when you don't use it right. <clears throat> you only get, uh, 0 0.26. Let me convert that. That's 3.12 inches. Three. 0.12 inches in huh. focus hmm. so that's all you have in focus so you better make sure it's on the eye <laughs> <laughs> so, so back them up so, i mean you got a 135 anyway so you're gonna back up you're not gonna shoot at 10 feet right yeah right exactly so yeah you gotta back up a whole lot but then if you're in a small room you know so let's change it to a more reasonable lens here uh let's go with a 50 and uh see here so 50 at 10 feet away f4 that's quite reasonable, almost two feet. So mm -hmm. you can, you you might be able to get even four or five people in focus if you know they are not too far off the same plane. So it's good to play around with stuff like this and just have an idea of what your lens does. So whenever I I see a big crowd of people, I usually like to use my thirty five, and if I have to step back, I step back because any wider than the thirty five, unless I'm doing the whole party you know when the whole when everybody decides to come together and get a group shot it's good to it's okay to shoot it on something very wide but if it's just you know families and stuff anything wider than 35 it looks a little wonky to me so yeah you should bookmark this page now yeah and you but, know what uh he made a good point here uh which is which yeah is through which is very true and let me find a friend is frame. dropping the knowledge tonight yeah yeah all right okay so i just i just selected a full frame camera instead and um that gives us a little bit more depth of field yeah Th thank you very much mr uh, ophamud what's his name ben ben ben, ben. thank thank he's Thanks, been watching ben. since day one yeah, you need to cut, you need to come on and drop some uh, gems on here. Yeah, it's good to, right. know, man. It's good to know this kind of like background stuff. 
All or right. just say we so, try to understand it. So enough of the the math, the math. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody just bought a new camera, right? And then we are trying to give the person tips to make their life easy, help them out, whatnot. Yeah. Uh, so talking about picture quality, what picture quality would you suggest they shoot in? Raw. Yeah, uh, for a beginner, I always say shoot raw plus JPEG. Raw plus JPEG. Uh, yeah. The reason is that maybe at the, at the beginning you don't have the skills or the knowledge level or even the time to learn how to process your images, right? So yeah. shooting raw plus JPEG mm -hmm. gives you the ability to have the JPEGs that you can use and share right away. Uh, but as your photography skills grow and you begin to learn how to post process and stuff like that. There may be some shots that you took at the beginning that you feel like, man, I can do more with this picture. And you have that raw image there that you can actually start to begin to learn to learn post processing with those kind of raw raw images and play around with them. Right. Um, so yeah, sh your goal is to end up shooting raw. Um, but raw plus JPEG it's is also, you know. Uh, What's the difference between raw and JPEG Evans? So if you're shooting raw, basically you're taking all the data that your sensor is putting out uh, mm -hmm. into that one file, and the file size is going to be bigger. Uh, if you're shooting JPEG, your camera is baking in all those settings. So when you come to edit, you don't have much data there to play with. So a typical JPEG file may be at most maybe 10, 10 megabytes. Whereas yeah. you can have a raw file that can be as big as 20, 30, 40 megabits uh, or megabytes, depending on the camera sensor size, mm -hmm. because you have all that data. So you have your light data, you have your white balance data, all stored in the raw form so yeah. that you can change and adjust them. Yep. Mm -hmm. Always <laughs> raw. Is the raw of my dream for his reliance on the <laughs> film. <laughs> we're not there yet. True. Back in the days yeah, yeah. when when we were shooting film, there was nothing like so raw so, jpeg. <laughs> so I worked. I I worked for a photo company that um shot everything in jpeg. They didn't edit their pictures. And like pictures were pretty much sold on the spot. They depended on lighting and F8 <laughs> to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it was, I mean, there I, I learned a few things that it doesn't take much to uh, get people impressed with a picture with, with mm -hmm. proper lighting and a good setup, you know, um, you can get away with a lot. But if you can shoot raw, why not? You know, so this they were making a business decision. It was such that the whole they had a system where pictures came in and went through and were quickly processed and released as quickly as possible. So, but I, I saw some good images, I saw some good photographers come and go from the company, and I saw some really good images. And at the end of the day, if you can afford the space or whatnot, if you are just shooting family and stuff it could be okay to shoot jpeg but making raw habit is the safer thing to do yeah yeah and and like i said i i've shot um when i'm busy with weddings there's two things i do normally at weddings so i have what i call the insta print right yeah, I love that. where at the wedding um i have either myself or a second photographer whose job it's just take pictures of the guests um, and stuff like that, and reprint them instantly on the spot for them. I love right? that. I love so that. So in that camera, we're just shooting both raw and JPEG because we keep the raws for later on if we want to post post some of them. But the JPEGs are there for us to just take right away, print it off um, on, the, on the table right there, five by sevens and stuff mm -hmm. like that for, for people to take right away with them, right? Uh, so it's not bad to shoot JPEG, but you need to understand um, um, lighting a lot more because at the beginning, you don't really know much about lighting. You don't really know more about anything. So shooting that raw plus JPEG gives you that ability to, um, when you want to learn to post process, to have that raw data there to use, right? Um, like 
once you know how to light properly, how to expose properly and stuff like that, yeah, you can get away with JPEG in a lot of situations. Uh, but until the point where you, you have mastered lighting, you have mastered how to expose your images, um, you're, you're, you keep that safe, safe um, distance of having the raw files as backups. It's there if you need it. Yep. There if you need it. Uh, Kobe. All right. So um, my next question for you guys, I think we've spoken about this before, and but it's always good to hit on it again. Um, so for me, <laughs> when I first started, uh, it got to a point I was convinced my camera was not good enough, right? So mm -hmm. I got the next camera and my images didn't improve. <laughs> <laughs> so it was then that I realized that mm -hmm. it wasn't about the camera and that the, the extra couple of thousand I just spent on the camera was, I should have probably put that towards lenses or something like that. Course, yes. Because I didn't learn the, the craft and a new camera is not going to make your images better. So uh, what do you have to say about gas, gear acquisition syndrome? <laughs> mm. Wait, who has it here, by the way? <laughs> Let's start gear. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so my advice is um, this. If you can look at it in one of two ways, right? You can either buy the, the best camera you can afford at that point in time once and use it as you grow, right? You grow with it. Or sometimes you also end up with a situation where you buy what the cheapest that you think you can afford, and then you think you have outgrown it, right? Um, when I first started, I bought a T5. Mm -hmm. I used that T5 for almost two to three years. I actually even shot weddings with a T5. When I first started shooting weddings, I was using the Rebel T5. I shot with a T5 for a while, uh, but it got to the point where I realized that the low light performance of the T5 is not satisfying my needs right especially when i get into um, weddings in the receptions and stuff like that and i'm looking back at my images so i decided to upgrade now that's where i make my i made my first mistake at that point i probably should have looked out and got you know a full frame or something that i know i could grow with right instead i looked at the um what do you call it the 7d mark ii and i thought i could grow with that yeah. And yeah, it worked for me for a couple of years. Um, I, I didn't see much of an improve, improvement with the low light performance, but it, it was good because it had it was faster, focusing was better in low lights and stuff like that than the T5. So it was good. Um, but like I said, at that time, it would have made sense for me to maybe go up and buy a full frame instead mm -hmm. of being in an APS-C. Because at that time, I personally, I had started shooting weddings that I was... I was getting paid for, right? So sticking with the APS-C and investing with the APS-C lenses for me was a mistake because I should have invested more in the full frame and full frame lenses that I could have grown with. Right. So it, it all depends on where you look at it from. If you don't buy the equipment the right, right the first time, you will end up wasting more money. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's there's a give and take with, with that. Kobe, Kobe makes a good point. You gotta understand what you're doing. Yeah, yep. I agree with that. Yeah, it's always about. For me, yeah, for me, what I always say to people is that um, even if you, I'm, and I'm saying this from my own experience, even if you're shooting APS-C, invest in full frame lenses if you're going to make that investment. Yeah, because lens is the most when, important. Except when all your full frame lenses now you have to adapt them to be able to use them on mirrorless. It's just a yeah. never-ending <laughs> fiasco. <laughs> yeah, but you can still adapt. See, adapter for an adapter right. is cheaper than buying a whole new lens, right? Of course. So, yeah. in most cases, you won't be able to adapt your APS-C lenses if you're moving to a full frame. But your full frame lenses, you can adapt to any other system when you decide to change. Okay. Yeah. I would so, invest yeah. more in lenses than in the camera body. Yeah. And I always ask, like, do you need it or do you want it? Like, hmm. <laughs> do you need it or do you want it? Like, there's a fine line there, right? That's yeah. how I do it. In, in photography, they're both the same. It's, it's, it's wavy. It's a wavy line, Paul. 
<laughs> a friend of mine, yeah. um, his his wife said, "Did you did you order something else from Amazon?" And he was like, "You know what? The kid likes breaking the boxes, so uh, that's mm. why he ordered something else." From <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, Brian, do you have anything to add to that? Not as far as the lenses, no. Um, no, I just I, I agree that uh, if if you had the choice between buying a new body and buying an outstanding lens, then then go for the glass. The gla glass is forever. They're like diamonds. Yep. Is that They're a like song? <laughs> It should be. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Make it into a rap or something like that. Yeah. Glass always wins. And then Glass. the other thing I will Glass say is that it. don't be af don't be afraid to buy used. Oh yeah. Could mm -hmm. GG, man. Could GG all the way. Just make yeah. sure you don't get um, lemons. Make sure you test it out before you grab it. Yeah. But, um, buying used is as long as it's working perfectly. Um, it's it's a great way to to acquire the gear that you need. Yeah, m most of the time, people just sell stuff to get newer stuff. So uh, if you are fortunate, you get a, a a good one. And if you are into uh, buying new cameras and selling old ones, make sure you sell it in a timely fashion, because mm -hmm. one one month could be a difference, a five hundred dollar difference. Yeah, so the, the, the new release comes out or something. Exactly. You have to know when to sell the old one and be, be ready for the yeah. new one. Yeah. So you know, uh, there there have been times where I've actually sold gear and then I had to go and buy it back. <laughs> so, so if you could well, sell they, they actually you, you back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sucks. So do yeah, you guys no, know, not, not buy it back, but you end up buying the same thing the same the same okay, okay, you okay, did it, it, it right um like, like a couple a couple years ago i sold all my canon stuff um, and now that i have a black magic i need an ef lens mm. oh yeah right? congratulations on your black yeah. magic <laughs> Evans is the black magic yeah yesterday guys <laughs> can you show it up can you show it on the can you show it here on the show let's or yeah, oh, let's not here I think it's it I, was play, I was playing around rigging with it, but yeah. I got that mm. lens. Can't see. Can't see. Move, move it closer to your face. The Sony is refusing to focus on it. Yeah, yeah we you go. need an icon, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Listen, I don't know if you know this, but in your setting, there's a setting that says it, uh, Sony cameras won't focus on other cameras. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's like a marketing thing. Uh, uh, like Canon, and then it just goes off. Yeah. Like, so I picked this up used this afternoon. Nice, nice. Um, like I said, I mean, I didn't used is always better. You can get the same thing for like half the price. Um, so if you can get used and it's in really good condition. Um, get it. This one I got from an old guy who really hasn't really used it much. Right. So, yeah. what's your where do you where, do you, where do you find these deals? Facebook Marketplace. Facebook Marketplace. Kijiji. Yeah. You know. I'm paranoid now. If I if I do a Kijiji, they're gonna meet me at the police station and we're gonna exchange it there. <laughs> hey, that yeah. works too. Paranoid. <laughs> works too. It's it's safety for you, safety for the seller. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, before we, we wrap up, um, well, I have one question for you guys. So about a year or two ago, I I was listening to this uh, presentation from National Geographic photographers, and almost all of them, apart from one guy on the panel, prefer to shoot with a crop sensor. Hmm. And I'm thinking it's mainly because of reach, right? Do you guys think about any other reason why they would want to shoot on a crop sensor um well i i think it's mainly uh, the reach um outside of the reach um I, I don't see much advantages between them but there's also the size right some people want the lightweight um and not having to ha carry the heavier especially in the days of dslr where 
Mm. The difference between a crop and a full frame was big. So people would like to take the crop, smaller lenses, uh, less weight. Uh, yeah, but I mean, imagine taking like a taking an A6400 with a 400 mil lens, which is now effectively a 600 mil lens. Right, 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 right. I mean, and you're gonna you're gonna hit a gazelle from a half mile away. Right, and and you know what occurred to me too? Uh, could it be that the uh, the file sizes of the crop sensors are such that if they are shooting burst, they can go longer? Because when you are shooting something like a gazelle, they are definitely shooting bursts. They are shooting multiple frames. And so that, that could also be a reason. But I'm sure cameras have improved today to a point where that will not be a problem, but the reach will still be an advantage. So Well, if you talk about the reach, I don't really need to buy an APS-C to have the reach. With my Sony, I can punch <laughs> in and have a crop also in there, right? So as a if you're shooting... <laughs> so especially if you're shooting something like the a7 r4 series right where you have a bigger megapixel and you can actually punch in and still get like a 24 megapixel um you have that reach you don't really need an APS-C body for that reach hmm. well ben, well, hold on. ben, ben says same is... megapixel. ben says same megapixel so no size difference i don't think that's correct i think on my A7 III, if I have 24 megapixel and I punch into the, the super crop, it should be half or so, a little bit more than yeah. half. On the, on, the, on the A7 III, when you punch in, you get a 10 megapixel image. So I don't really punch in unless I really have to. But on the on the A7 R3 and the R4s, you get almost 24 megapixels because those have like 40 to 50 megapixels, right? Now, just, the question is, if you punch in, if you have a full frame, right? In, in the Nikon world, we call it FX and DX. FX is full frame, DX is crop sensor. So if you have a full frame and you decide to uh, go DX, the quality there coming from the lens compared to a crop sensor that is in the entire lens and not just the middle portion of the lens, what is the difference? Which is better? Uh, I didn't get the question. So, so you know, when, when you punch in, when you're using a full frame and you, you punch in, right, mm -hmm. what it does is that instead of taking information from the whole lens, it only takes from a section of it. A <laughs> section of the sensor doesn't read anything. Well, it, arguably, you're going to be using the sharpest part of the lens because most lenses, the sharpest should be in the middle. In the middle. However, like like in, like in my example, like Evans just said, if you if you drop my twenty four megapixel, and I now I'm getting a ten megapixel image, but instead if I'm shooting with the 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 A sixty four hundred, I'm still I'm still twenty four. Twenty four. So in that sense, it would be better to use the the crop sensor for sure. Right. And so if you use a crop sensor, you can even uh, be able to crop in some more in post. You know, you have that flexibility if you use Correct. an APS-C. But, right. but the one thing that I have noticed um, is that when you crop in, you're not really losing quality. You're losing resolution, right? So you may have a smaller file size, smaller megapixels, but as long as that 10 megapixel, you're not going to take it into post and try to crop it further, your image is really good at, for that quality. Don't forget that um, to print uh, maybe like what, a, a, a 12... Uh, 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 an eight by eight or eight ten by ten. All you need is a two megapixel file, <laughs> right? So ten megapixel to me is still big enough. And um, sometimes when I'm shooting weddings, if I need to quickly, um, if let's say I have a twenty four to seventy on my camera, right, and I need a shot that I have to punch in, I'm not afraid to punch in. But if I'm punching in, I'm making sure that my cropping and my framing is correct. So I'm not going to crop that image at all in post. So cropping in doesn't mean you're going to lose um, uh, kind of, well, like quality per se. In fact, okay. that may actually end up being sharper because you're using the center of the crop, right? Yeah. OK, OK, OK. Thank you. Thank Anybody has any other questions before we uh, round up for the day? Andre Williams is Team Sony. Just want to put that Andre out there. Williams. Andre, yeah. go Sony yeah, boys. Man. Sony <laughs> boys, man, they are, they are killing us. <laughs> you guys like those memes I send you, right? 
I sent. I uh, know Evans. I sent yeah. them to you. Sony, I got that one. <laughs> the Sony memes are the best. Yeah. <laughs> All we talk about is our dynamic range and. Yeah, yeah. Elbow cuff. <laughs> It's all right. That's okay. We, we got oh, a little okay. topic tonight, but it was yeah, fun. We should, make it a, we should make it a whole topic next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys very much uh, for being here today. And uh, you guys, let's go, Paul, Brian, Evans. Yeah. Wrap up. Let's go. Thanks everyone for jumping on. Hopefully, you took a couple things away from this. I certainly did. And uh, yeah, that's what it's all about. Even if you've been at photography a long time. It's always good to get a little bit of a refresher and some of the basics. And uh, yeah, make sure you like uh, the video, subscribe to Meek's channel if you haven't already, and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, and for me, thank you so much for being here. Um, um, I, I would like to especially thank my Patreon members who joined me, and I'll be releasing a new street photography video in the next couple days and the Patreon members will see it first and they also got some uh, behind the scenes too. So thank you for those that, uh, those of you that supported me. So um, that should be fun. And um, it looks like Evans has a YouTube video just about to. He's dropping a YouTube video. Like, was it during this show? <laughs> um, I, I, I have set it to premiere at, I think 8.45. Oh, oh. so we, everyone go to Evans' uh... You yeah, should I'm drop your link it. in the comments. I'm waiting for it. Yeah. Ten minutes. Meeks, Meeks, I'm at nine fifty. What are you at? Oh, oh, nine fifty. Oh, I've been stuck at nine forty-four for for a few days. I was telling Paul today. I yeah. was so pissed because usually I get one a day, and then it's been it's been like two, three days. So I haven't seen any subscriber. I'm like, what's up, people? <laughs> Subscribe. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. I, I have a few videos though. If I I feel like. It's still possible to to get it before the end of the year, but I don't know. It's less l l likely, but we'll see. Oh, you got it. You got it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, um, in conclusion, I'm just gonna say, you know, have fun with what you do. Um, the most important thing is to enjoy what you're doing. Um, go out, enjoy shooting. Don't forget to keep creating. But whilst you are there, be safe because you know how the world has changed with all this what we're going through. So. Be safe, go out there, create. Um, share some of your stuff with us. If you don't know, we have Instagram. We are also on, have a Facebook group. Um, let me see. I, I, oh, I'll post it in the private chat. Mix if you can put it in the comments because I, I can post the link. Okay. Um, so we have that group there. If you want to share anything, pictures, um, videos, go in there, share, get criticism from people get um you know feedback from other creators in the community um we also have another group dedicated to youtubers so you can also join that as well if you're a youtuber um the whole purpose of this community is to share ideas together learn together grow together so don't be afraid come out there share your stuff and join us every wednesday let's have chats let's talk about things everything creator oh yeah it's a great way to learn. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys uh, for being here. Man, it's December, man. We started this in March, right? Was it March or April? Yeah, man. Yeah. My goodness. I remember yeah. the first one. Yeah, man. So um, I'm glad you guys are all here. Thank you guys for sticking around. And uh, please check out the other channels, uh, Paul, Evans, Brian, um, and subscribe to every everyone on here except Evans because he's already monetized. So <laughs> don't, don't subscribe to Evans. too many. All right, guys. Thank you for sticking around. We'll see you next week. Uh, who who who's hosting next week? This time we have we can say who's hosting. Next I week, believe right? I'm hosting next week. Oh, okay, Evans put hosting next week. Man. Put on the calendar, eh? Right, yeah, right. So we are uh, we're gonna see you all on Evan's channel, and um, yeah, the topic's gonna be how yeah. and, and if you have a topic in mind you want to see us talk about next week, go in yeah. the Facebook group, um, leave a comment in there. I'm thinking something on the topic of video because we've been doing a lot of photo stuff. Um, yeah. but go out there, guys, let us know what you want to talk about next week in the in the comments in the group, and then we'll pick one out of that. Sounds good. Everyone's links are in the description below. Instagram, YouTube, you know, you can even make a story and tag us all in there and then 
you know, you probably win the topic of the day. There you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Peace. Peace. Good night. Good night.